Good morning. Um, I'm Jeff Jezef. I'm the Senior Vice President with, for Communications and Strategic Relationships with the Consumer Electronics Association. Thank you for joining me here this morning. I'm so excited to be joined by my good friend Robin Raskin. Um, we apologize for being late. Sometimes that's what happens when you live in digital. Right, Robin? Uh, yeah, usually. And you have great excuses, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. As much as we love technology, sometimes it can be a challenge. Let me tell you quickly about Robin. Um, Robin is a longtime tech journalist and commentator, uh, events organizer, product tester slash explainer in chief. Um, she's always been interested in the ability of tech to empower different communities, whether it's uh, young people, the elderly, kids, uh, families, women. Um, she's been writing about technology since the, uh, the 1980s. Her first article, I love this, True Confessions documented her attraction to technology as an equalizer for women because ultimately it would provide them freedom without shackling them to an office. And we'll sort of see how we will talk a little bit about how we've progressed over the last uh, 30 or so years. Um, she wrote for Family Computing where she tested uh, products and explored attempts to empower youth through technology. I first met Robin when she was served as a uh, senior editor at PC Magazine and then she wrote to, rose to executive editor and then editor. Um, and we continued to collaborate when she became the editor-in-chief of Family PC Magazine, where she helped develop the concept of leads us to where we are today. Robin's been named one of the best columnists, tech columnists, by the Computer Press Association, and has been recognized as one of the top ten tech journalists. Um, you may have seen her on CBS This Morning, MSNBC, Fox TV, or you may have read one of her several books on raising digital kids. Um, she also produces for uh, the International CS, January 6th through 9th in Las Vegas, 2015, um, one of our most popular marketplaces and events, Living in Digital Times. So welcome, Robin. Um, what is Living in Digital Times? What, how do you define that? All about those episodes in my life. I'll have you know I sold that first column for $25 to InfoWorld about women's role in the, in the new computer world, and so far it hasn't... Uh, done me wrong. So living right. in digital times, living right? exactly. I saw when my husband brought home that Unix system. I saw the whole world flash before my eyes, <laughs> and I started when I was two. That's so um, living in digital times is a different way to look at technology. We believe that technology is there for the right moment in your life. So when you're a child, you're certainly more technological than any other generation before, but you get introduced differently, your products are different as you become a family, you're, you're different as you become an old elderly, uh, your technology needs are dis different. So what we try and do is tell the story of technology that's appropriate for that moment in your life. And we've expanded that to include digital health, uh, fitness tech, staying in shape, uh, transforming education, uh, new technology is so much a part of what's happening in the educational landscape. So basically, if we can use technology products to tell the story that grows a market and fits a market, we get all excited. Well, let's, let's, I'm, so I'm, as you know, I'm a father of two girls, 11 and 13. What technology are you seeing that will help me as a parent and help us as a family to sort of stay connected and stay in touch? So. Clearly, this is the mobile generation. And one thing that has occurred to me is, you know, there's a lot of parents, like you, I'm sure, who worry about their kids and screen time versus, but now what you're seeing with this new generation of products is that distinction is blurring. Screen time, real time, it's all the same time mm -hmm. uh, because the screen is now in their pocket. It's not like I'm sitting at my dad's desk playing a game on the computer. So you may have a moment of sharing over an iPad. You may have a bracelet. We're seeing a lot of family communication bracelets. There's one from VTech. There's an activity band from LeapFrog. There's one I just tried on this morning called Moth, which actually lets you wear a wearable band, wave your hand like a sword, play imaginative play as you're um, doing things. So all of these wearables and mobile devices or letting families stay in touch, but kind of in a fun way. Right. So, so 
you talk a lot about that sort of screen time, and you and you mentioned sort of connectivity over sharing over a, a tablet or something, which 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 we do. But it does become a struggle. Um, you know, look, I'm a tech fan, right? I make my living off being a tech evangelist, and I love technology. But it is it does become a struggle when I see my kids sort of, you know, they're completely engrossed into their their small screen, um, the way I used to be engrossed into my big screen playing video games or, or whatever when I was young. But how, how do you how do you sort of get that right balance between empowering kids to enjoy a Appreciate and utilize technology, whether it's you know for for their socialization, whether it's for their schoolwork, but still maintaining that that connectivity as a family. Well, number one, I think you are the example you set for your kids. You probably agree. So, as much as you are so bored of listening to their times tables or their Spanish, you do not look <laughs> at your email bored. messages. You know, and so there there are certain things they do what they see, and there are certain rules that you set in your family. But more and more, I'm holding this little thing called an Ozobot in my hand. I don't know. There you go. You can yeah, see it. Can it's see. a little robot that follows a colored trail. So I can hold up flashcards with I'll get a pattern out that actually respond to color. Ah, there we go. So now my robot's moving along here. When it sees yellow, it goes faster. When it sees blue, it stops. Kids can use magic markers and draw with this. There we go. Draw things like this that mm -hmm. the robot sensors in it to follow along. So kids don't know it. They're programming. You're playing with them. This is a family activity. That's Ozobot. I've got another one here called Tiggly, which are really physical blocks that you play with and your iPad uh, talks back to you and gives you new games and new challenges. Cool. So this year, I think what we're excited about is you're seeing the physical and the screen worlds collide. So when you have play time with your kids, after all those things are done, <laughs> you, um, can share, you can share a screen, but you can also share some tactile things too. And anybody who knows their Montessori, tactile is great. That's right. That's right. All right. We've talked a little about kids. How about going to the other end of the spectrum? You know, when you're around our respective ages, we're also dealing with aging parents. What have you seen? What trends are you seeing for the elderly? How is technology helping empower them in the way we communicate with our parents as they age? Yeah. So I think you're seeing the same thing, but put in the right packaging. You're seeing sensors, Bluetooth, mobile devices, and the cloud come together. So there are devices that, uh, for example, Great Call has a device that my own mom uses that lets me track. Should it's an, it's a personal emergency system, but unlike the ones that were limited to your house, now because of the cellular network and GPS coordinates, she can go out if she has a problem. One button press gets her to a human operator mm. who then can notify me if there's a problem. It can remind her to take her medicines. It can. Um, there, you're also seeing devices like the Internet of Things where I can control her light switch, her door lock. We have a product that's been on the market called Lively, um, which actually tells you when you're leaving the uh, it will notify me when my mom is leaving the house if she hasn't gone to the kitchen yet. Depending on where I put these sensors, I get alerts notifying me if she's had any sort of change of behavior. Uh, we all know fitness and tracking bands. They are starting to be used for people who have conditions like um, uh, blood respiratory problems or glucose, diabetic problems, where they're monitoring has it been two hours since you had any sugar or something to drink? Um, is your oxygen level okay? If you look at the new My Basis band from Intel, this thing has like 18 different sensors in it doing everything from galvanic skin response to oxygen, so uh, of the blood pulse oximetry. So you now have a pretty good indicator remotely just from your mobile phone of somebody's health, not your own. I kind of say, actually, the most amazing thing these days is you know more about your own healthy body than your doctor probably knew about sick bodies 10 years ago. <laughs> it's amazing. So you, you talk about, and we, we talk at CS a lot about that, you know, we've gone through this this uh, era of the last 30 years. We've gone from analog to digital. Those digital objects became connected uh, via the Internet, um, and you move from connectivity to, to sensors, um, sort of creating this so-called Internet of Things. And we talk a lot about that at CS and in the industry, you and I. But what does it mean for the average household? I mean, that's a great example of a benefit I can see. But how about for the, the average family? What do you see as a killer app in that so-called Internet of Things? What's going to make that a marketplace success for, for the average family? 
One that I love is my door lock. You know, you come in, your hands are full, you can't carry anything, not so safe, woman, alone, dark. You know, motion sensored lights that you can control, you know, uh, with your phone, key locks, those are really useful things to have. Um, there's some others that are questionable, like last night, and I love it. I turn on my Belkin crock pot remotely, yeah, yeah. but I had to laugh at myself also. Uh, <laughs> because it's sort of like, just kind of, it can be done, so I did it. Um, so I can actually start my crock pot from just off of my mobile phone. I can um, brush my teeth now from off of, you know, a, and let my... Um, results of how long I brush each quadrant of my mouth gets sent to my, I, my my mobile phone. So some of these things we're going to see are going to become a little superfluous to our lives and some are going to be really important. And if you can gamify your children brushing their teeth or washing their hands you know, with technology, I think it's going to be fun. Some are going to stick, some won't. Well, that's part of the fun of technology. Now, you talked about robots earlier, and you mentioned robots again. Do I really need a robot in my home? I, I, lo I love the concept of the Roomba. That's pretty cool. The device you showed for my kids, that's pretty cool. But really, do I need my house? What's, what's happening in the area of robots that make you so excited about them? Well, I think robots, we're, st we're still at the playful stage. So this year, you're going to see uh, Wowie has new robots for us. Spin Master is announcing some cool things at our show. So we're still at the... Best used now for kids wanting to become coders um, who want to understand sequential thinking, visual, visually processing things. But on the periphery, you're seeing a bunch of new experimental robots that will mop your floor, wash your windows, make your bed. Possibly, and one of the most poignant ones I see is actually be an aid to an aging person. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the things that older people suffer from the most turns out to be a lack of contact with the outside world. Now, is a robot contact with the outside world? Could be. Um, telepresence so that I don't have to go to the doctor and run across town to get my blood checked, but I can do it in my home with the peripheral to my PC, sent via robot or telepresence to my doctor. Those things are going to be really revolutionary and they're starting to happen this year. So robots you're seeing what you'll see them at CES carrying cups, washing windows, <laughs> um, picking up the trash. They're they're a force to be reckoned with. And if you think about um, the clutter in a home and the stuff that there is to do, and how parents can't possibly keep up with all these things, um, there's there's something to it. A, a sock sorter robot. <laughs> if my robot could find those socks missing around my so you'll see Baxter and Rethink Robotics and some really exciting on the cuff. Um, personally, I think industry is the first place robotics are going to be uh -huh. really big, and they already are, uh, replacing a lot of the job force, something to be paid attention to. But eventually, they will be in our home, starting with the fun entertainment. Okay, so you've gone through a lot of different examples of things that we think we'll see at CS and that you're sort of seeing trends. But what, what really stands out to you when, when you next week when you're with your family and friends for the Thanksgiving holiday and they're asking you, okay, Robin, you, you have this great bird's view, bird's eye view of this industry. What are you going to tell them about? What are you going to be most excited to share? So on the everyday level, I'm really excited about fitness. These trackers, and I bought my whole family $50 Misfit Shine. Don't tell them. Um, <laughs> Talk secret. You, the new plastic shine so that everybody has some idea of whether they're moving or not. I think it's really important. We have a little family competition going. Those are so low cost and accessible now and they really give you insights in how you sleep and how you move whether it's Misfit or Jaybird or Polar or Fitbit. There's lots to choose from. Um, I wrote a column for you on the blog yesterday about how to start to choose. On the higher end I'm kind of jazzed up about augmented reality's possibility with mixed feelings and trepidation. Um, to be able for a kid in education to walk through a molecule, I never understood geometry. But I think if I put on my augmented goggles and walk through that Pythagorean theorem, I might get it. <laughs> so this idea of feeling something, trial and error, building something by augmented reality, I think you're going to see the beginning of this being the next wave. And of course, 
The other thing is the wearables that we're all excited about today, like the two on my arm, will get smaller and smaller. You'll see earpieces this year at the show that can mm. monitor your heart rate. Event, you'll see the beginnings of swallowable pills that can offer an inside look at your body. So on the health front, the miniaturization that's helping you wear bracelets is just today. Tomorrow, it will be even more smaller and embedded. Maybe your clothing. Maybe your clothing, which we'll see at CS2 in, in the wearables. We, we started off, Rob, when I introduced you, I talked about your sort of uh, professional career of looking at technology and how it empowers these different communities. Uh, as you look back over the last 30 years or so, you know, can, you, can you see, the, were, were you right? Were you pressing it? Have you seen technology em, empower, say, women in, um, um, in the workplace or, 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 or women at home? What, have you seen success stories? I am a technology optimist. So by and large, yes, I am. I have seen education democratized and equalized where at least people all over the world have access and it's not quite there yet and it always needs improvement but to have access to the greatest minds to Stanford and to MIT in some form to educate yourself. I have seen older people learn how to live a more dignified life because their monitors taking care of their lighting and their everyday things. So yeah, overall, and I think it's let women decide there are plenty of, you know, I like to say innovation is, the center of innovation is at home now. And women can decide, I want to work home, I want to work out of the house, I don't want to work, I want to raise the kids, and use technology to help um, moderate those changes in their life. Mm -hmm. And give them a little more freedom, as you say, and empowerment to, to, to control that balance. I mean, I thought it was cool when my husband brought home printouts the night after I wrote something and let me see them. So now that, you, you know, everything is immediate, do you lose something, possibly some reflection, a music time to take stock of overdoing technology? Absolutely. There are technologies that teach you to meditate now, you know. So I think um, we have to be super aware and vigilant of our technology habits, but overall, I'm all thumbs up. Well, let's, let's go there just a little bit. So do you hear from, as you, as you go out and travel the country, you do your events, or as you write and hear back from readers, what are their fears about technology? You know, clearly, um, as we look at the Internet of Things, where everything's connected and, 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 uh, and monitoring and reporting, there's these, these concerns about privacy, um, security of data um, in, in the uh, personal health space. What are you hearing? What, what trepidation, what fears are you hearing from consumers as you, as you interact with them? Yeah, privacy, um, I think people still need huge awareness right now, especially my own children, and I'm sure yours, are way too eager to trade in privacy for a badge or a free download or right. whatever. Um, Starbucks right card, now, yeah. I think most of the services are using our data as aggregate data and not targeting us, but it is always amazing that as soon as I book a vacation, I'm flooded with ads you know, to go do things in that town. So be very aware of what happens to you um, when you're online. I think the jobs market is also a problem. There is no doubt in my lifetime and yours we've seen robots and uh, automation take over a lot of basic functions. And when robots can serve a hamburger or mop the floor or put together a, another robot faster than you, that's frightening. And then probably the third thing is what I'm going to call machine to machine, let's skip us. So when your Nest thermostat talks to your car and knows you're coming home, you're out of the equation. Your machines now have this little ecosystem that does not involve you. And um, the Google car is probably the best example. It has a million different monitors going on. It's looking at camera views and real-time GPS and a million different talking to each other. You're not involved. So that's our future. And so we almost have to create a new involvement for us, um, which is bizarre. <laughs> but it's just different. I mean, we're still engaged. I mean, they're still monitoring what we're doing. They're still translating that physical activity that we may be engaged in to digital to be able to, to talk to each other. It, it, we, I, I, it sounds like you're almost describing this this Orwellian world or, or, or more like um, the Terminator, right? Where Skynet yes. controls everything. And that's that's fearsome. That's frightful, frightening. It is. And what I laugh at, I, mean, I think it came to me the other day. I saw an eight-year-old sitting in a biology class, YouTube video, saying, I just sequenced my first DNA. And 
God love her. That is so terrific. Here's a little girl. She's sequencing DNA. She's excited. But the implications of that, of um, that, some of the technology, uh, I, I will almost say, gone rampant without thinking about um, the models. You know, I'm big on what's the future of money. I don't even think in five years you we'll get back here. You're going to have your Google Wallet and your Apple. Um, you're going to have bitcoins. I might trade you a chicken. You know, <laughs> I mean, before <laughs> they're done. So I think that um, we're in such an upheaval. We've already seen, you know. Uh, most traditional media um, are displaced, I won't say replaced, by, by new media, television, movies, books. Uh, I think money is really online for replacement, and so are jobs as we know them today. That's not saying we're just going to sit on a beach for the rest of our lives and boss robots around, but we do need to think about what we, where we sit in this equation. And mostly, the flip side of that is, we have an opportunity through technology to effect change all over the world, to solve water shortages, to solve disease, to solve hunger, um, to maximize agriculture. Um, so let's you know sort of shift our attentions, just like Gutenberg did with the printing press. Let's start to shift our attentions to some of these emerging technologies that's really working for us. That's that's a great point. Uh, I was I, the. Uh, opportunity to interview the president of Parrot. They make those great mini drones that you've seen. We got to interview him a few weeks ago, and he talked about you know drones not just as consumer devices, as awesome aerial cameras, or or even as uh, commercial devices with Amazon delivering. But imagine having drones, uh, having them be able to deliver um, pharmaceuticals to people who live in rural areas or sub-Saharan Africa. You know that that that, that we sometimes yeah. look at the technology from a very personal impact perspective instead of looking, as you said, more globally at some of those more profound uh, implica implications. Both the uh, the frightening and, and potentially uh, undermining as well as the, the uh, incredibly uh, hopeful and, and positive. Right, and in Parrot's case and in the drones, the cost of delivery of heavy tonnage is mere pennies, so that becomes less of a, an obstacle. And the other thing, I saw a drone that was amazing. It flew over farmlands and it tested the soil from aerial views, so you're not overwatering or under, I mean, look at Californians now, you're right. not Overwatering or underwatering, over fertilizing, you are doing sustainable agriculture, and we've got to, um, you know, start to figure out solutions like that. So, that's kind of the great upside of all that. Um, downsides are you look up in the sky and there's a million things flying around. You, are, you know one of them. Uh, I think that. it's pretty cool, but that's just me. We only have a couple minutes left, um, so I do. We're going to see all these trends at CES. You've been attending CES for for a number of years. What have you seen change over the years since you first uh, first came to CES? What's what's different? Let's see. Well, for one thing, I think the tent has become bigger, but still personal. I think CES has done a great job of extending. The umbrella, if you remember, CES started kind of like as a sort of audio on steroids, you know, <laughs> cables and, and televisions, and, and now its world is as encompassing as tech and innovation itself and has made newcomers, uh, everybody from Reddit to Eureka Park folks who spend their, you know, are just getting started in this business, want to learn, their mentoring program. So I think CES has been pretty vigilant. I will say, um, I uh, was I worked for Comdex for a long time, and Comdex is no longer in existence. And I think the ability to change and reinvent without losing what's good, scale without losing scale, are, are really important at CES. Um, I think. Um, you know, I like to say you go to the CES show floor, you'll have enough business for the next year, just coming <laughs> out from what, what you get during the show. Um, but what always amazes me are how easy it is to see the big trends. Mm -hmm. So if I had to say, you know, last year's trend, you know, I called it the bigger and smaller trends. Bigger televisions by, you know, uh, big, bigger screens. Um, curved screens were very big last year. And smaller, smaller devices. Um, this year, I think the show's going to be about Internet of Things. It's going to be about wearables. It's going to be about robotics. But it's going to be about a lot about putting the pieces of this new ecosystem together, sensors, Bluetooth, into some incredible 
ways. And, um, you know, my personal exciting, I love the fashion part. We do an area on the show called Wearable Tech that turns into a live runway fashion show. How great is it that sort of the, the fashion industry can be paying attention to the tech industry now going, why can't I wear a jacket that knows if I'm sweating and do something about it? Right, right. Um, and so it's all the, um, so I think Internet of Things and wearables are going to be huge this year. Very good. We do. We actually have L'Oreal of all companies. They're they're exhibiting this year. Um, we don't know what they're showing, but it's amazing that uh, that sort of a beauty company would be coming to to see us. To your point, that we're at this where we see this uh, incredible intersection of all these different industries, all these disciplines coming um, into that consumer tech space. And where better to be than at CS and living in digital times? You got it. All okay. right, excellent. Well, thank you, the always amazing Robin Raskin. Thank you for joining me this morning. Um, we are looking forward to your production of Living in Digital Times at the 2015 International CES, running January 6th through 9th in, in Las Vegas. Uh, Living in Digital Times includes exhibits on, on all these areas we've talked about, fashion, wearables, um, health tech, and on and on and on. We have your famous last gadget standing, always one of my favorite uh, uh, parts of the show, where we, we actually have a competition of, 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 uh, of some of the products that are introduced. and. The audience gets to vote on their favorites. That's always fun. So much more going on. Um, go to www.csweb.org to learn more. Um, register. And Robin, we can follow you at www.livingindigitaltimes.com. And you, there you can get to all our places. And yeah, deadline to register for Last Gadget and Mobile App Showdown, run by Gary Delbody and John Hine from the Howard Stern Show. Bob and uh, Coming up right after Thanksgiving. <laughs> Outstanding. And I'm Jeff Joseph. You can follow me at, at J. Joseph. Hope to see you in Vegas for CS, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Robin. Great to be here. Thanks, Jeff.